Oh, well, that was abrupt. Hi, everybody. So much for my fade out. <laughs> it's Debbie Levitt from Delta CX, a full service CX and UX agency. Welcome, low ego action heroes, to today's special edition micro lesson on task analysis and optimization. I like to think of this one as the do over. Take two. We had done this one before, but it didn't quite end up the way that we had hoped, so that video has been taken down and Larry Marine will be joining us today to take another shot at our task analysis. Um, this should run about an hour, and of course we hope that you will follow and subscribe wherever you might find us. Uh, we are now streaming on Twitch, which has less than a seven second delay, so if you want me to see your question or comment super fast, I suggest you join us on Twitch, where we are DeltaCX.com, because some was Delta CX. So hello, Shannon. Uh, so of course, without further ado, let me bring in Larry who can tell you who the heck he is. Welcome, Larry. Who the heck are you? <laughs> well, I've been a UX uh, designer uh, for about 30 years now. Um, more than 15. Uh, <laughs> yeah, more than 15. Um, I learned from Don Norman and this task analysis process is one of the things I learned from him. I've been using it for about 30 years. I've evolved it uh, over the years. I've worked on about 250, 300 projects over the years and have, have applied this and evolved it over that time. So what you're going to see is an evolved process of what I learned from Don Norman. Not a bad source, you know, not a bad source. And, and in case anybody is unfamiliar with Don Norman, you know what I always say, Google him. Uh, so <laughs> on that note, uh, Larry's got a lovely PowerPoint prepared for us today. We have a mural board, which you are not invited to. So sit back and watch today. Uh, there's, there isn't going to be audience participation this time, but we do welcome all of your comments and questions. Uh, in fact, let me fire up the rest of my windows. Uh, we will be able to see your questions on YouTube and, oh, um, pressing buttons and pressing buttons, YouTube and Twitch and even Twitter with the hashtag Delta CX. So um, ask all those questions. Um, so Larry, should we start with your slides? You, I'm, Larry's driving today and I'm the pair of hands. I'm, the, I'm Vanna White today. Uh, yeah, Debbie gets to be the uh, wizard behind the curtain. <laughs> all right, so yeah, let's go ahead and open up the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, let's see, next slide perhaps. Oh, hold on, uh, audio, there, you're back. Oh, I was, go oh, that's right. You remember, I, I have to remember to turn, it's a weird thing in my system. It turns off Larry's audio when I switch to the PowerPoint. So be patient, and thanks. And switching back and forth, so. I will be. Yeah. All right. So uh, task oriented user experience processes is just one part of the human centered design process. Um, that we've been following for years. So you always start off with observational research um, rather than uh, basing it on any you know, assumptions or guesses or anything you might have. So you start with the observational research and I'll tell you a little bit more about each of these steps as we go. Then you do some task analysis. And here's where things get really different. Instead of doing personas first, you do a task role description, and I'll describe that as we go along. And then once you have all of that done, you optimize the tasks. And then once you have the, the tasks optimized, meaning you've removed some of the friction points, et cetera, et cetera, then you design your interface or your product or your service for that matter to the tasks, to the user's tasks. And then of course, you test, rinse, and repeat. And so let's go to the next slide. What do you look for in an observation? I like to think that there's four basic things that you're looking for when you're watching people do their job. Try to identify things that are manually intensive, where they have to do a lot of things with their hands or feet for that matter, but things that are you know manually intensive, um, because those are an opportunity to take out some of that manual work and get the system to do some of the work for the user. The same holds true for cognitive or mentally demanding tasks. Do the users think a lot? Are they having to keep track of a lot of things? You know, are, are they really focused in on their task? How can we find ways for to get the system to do some of that work for the user? And then the third thing I like to focus on to also is, 
are there error prone steps that you're uh, witnessing that the users are committing where a lot of people seem to make a mistake or are frustrated or stumble or have to correct themselves? Because again, those are an opportunity to get the system to do something for the user that uh, removes or that potential for error. And the last one I think is the most critical, and that is, can you identify any knowledge dependencies? And by that, I mean, are there tasks or steps of the task that the user has to have knowledge about in order to succeed? And as we go into this a little bit deeper, I'm gonna talk about the difference between what you can expect your users to know going into the task. For instance, nurses have some knowledge about some of the tasks they have to perform with their patients. And is there knowledge that the users are required to know, but you don't think that they actually will know? And so we want to identify that knowledge gap. Can I throw an example out there? It, tell me if I'm wrong here, because I'm just going to play random question asker until we have questions in the chat. So something that we expect people to know that they may or may not know, in a, in a very simple case, could this be, what's your account number? And people don't have that information handy? That's a good example. That's a very simple example. Uh, people know they have an account, but quick, what's the account number for your bank? I happen to know mine, but most people don't, but they still have an account. And there's a lot of forms that they have to do. Like, okay, what's your bank account number? They have to look it up. How can you find a way to help people have that information available when they need it uh, without them having to go look it up? That's a great example. Or ask example. them the information that they do have. They know their email address. They know their phone number. Is there another way they could get in without a certain piece of knowledge? So I just want to make sure the audience understands that the idea of, of knowledge and what knowledge people have isn't like a broad encyclopedia of things. It could be as simple as what's your account number versus put in your email address. One of those you definitely know. That's that's a great point. And yes, it is contextual. So it's going to be specific knowledge, not just general knowledge. Great point. My pleasure. Where can we go next? <laughs> We're going to go back to the um, PowerPoint. All right. Wish me luck. I'm going to turn on your audio. <laughs> I did it. All right. Now I have to push next slide. So many buttons. No, you stopped that. I turned it on. <laughs> He's making me look bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in task analysis. Oh, wait, by the way, they really... can't see you. So they couldn't see that you were mouthing things as a joke. They can only see the slides. Oh. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Okay. So um, in task analysis, which is, you know, after we've done the observations and look for those four things manually intensive, cognitively demanding, error prone, and knowledge dependent. Once we have that information, then we're going to do task analysis flow diagrams. And we're going to do those in really four steps. First, the big picture of what you observed. And then you're going to take a second pass to add a little bit more detail and break things out. And after all of that's done, you will eventually get around to optimizing it. But there's a step in there that I'm going to uh, introduce too. And then, of course, you're going to fill out the details and then you start designing. So let's go to the mural board and we'll Wish talk about the luck. first stage. Okay. All right. Hold on. Mural board. Here we go. Okay. Is everybody seeing right. the mural board? <clears throat> All right. So um, this is a post-it note exercise. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Sticky note. You can't use that without <laughs> giving credit. Um, so I use the different colors and I, I use these colors because when I bought the five packs, these were the colors in them, so I adapted. Um, I use the green to identify what steps or actions the user is taking. I use the yellow to indicate what steps a system, such as a product or a service, I don't, you know, I use a generic term called system. And the purple I use to identify any artifacts, anything that the user might use, such as a tool, such as notes, such as specific knowledge. Um, and then oh, obviously there's always questions or issues that come up and I represent those as orange. And then, you know, I use pink as the catch all, the miscellaneous. So here's the idea. In the big picture analysis, which is this first flow that we're going to see here, you can scroll up a little bit, All right, is just really what is the big picture of um, 
I gotta do mine so I can read it. So we're gonna talk about how to buy flowers. I like to use Pro Flowers as an example. I even mentioned in the announcement uh, that I broadcast on LinkedIn that maybe you should go to my website and read that story because it, it's a very clear example of how to include knowledge into the task to make the user's task easier. So let's look at what the observed behaviors were on, on, at the big picture level. Uh, the buyer can I just fill in shop. some story for? Can I fill in a little bit of story for a moment? Sure. Okay, so very quickly, everybody, to catch you up. Uh, when last you left us off, in the late 90s, Larry worked for an online flower, uh, uh, it was online and offline, called Pro Flowers. And it was one of the earliest examples of buying flowers from an e-commerce website. But they found that it wasn't going as well as they had hoped. So Larry and his buddies and his teammates uh, went into actual flower shops to observe what people were doing in the course of buying flowers. So this is where you're picking up the story. Larry has done his observational research. He's watched people in the pl flower shops, and now he's going to build his task analysis diagram. I think that backstory was important. Back to you. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, thanks. Sure. So again, the observations were done, and this is what we found. The buyer enters the, the flower shop. Instead of watching people buy flowers online, by the way, we actually went to flower shops because we knew how people bought online and that wasn't the important thing we wanted to learn. So we, a buyer walks into the flower shop and the clerk comes up and asks, so you need flowers? And it wasn't so much so you need flowers and they didn't even ask what flowers you needed. They asked, why do you need the flowers? Most often there were men buying flowers for women and sometimes the question was, okay, what did you do wrong? What do you have to say sorry? And so in this case, Again. in a lot of cases, uh, the guy would say, well, I, I need flowers because I, I forgot my wife's birthday. And then the clerk, instead of saying, what kind of flower again? Do you need fleur de lil? Do you need tiger lilies? They asked or, you know, they said, OK, so you need an apology bouquet. Here are some bouquets. And then the guy would say, well, my wife likes purple, so I think I'm going to get that purple bouquet. So. Um, what else we learned was that people buy just one bouquet at a time, typically. And anyway, so the, the buyer would select a bouquet and then they would purchase the flowers. That is the big picture. That's we, we didn't get into all the steps on how they pay for it or what choices they make in selecting and all of that. We can do that later. So once we have that big picture and we feel confident with that, then we move to what I call the second pass which is gonna, a little bit more deep. I'm going to throw myself in again before we do that. Everybody, now's your chance to ask a question. If there is anything at this point that you're unsure about, that's confusing, please, please ask, especially if you're on Twitch or YouTube where the delay is short. So I'm just going to quickly um, reiterate some of the things Larry said while I wait to, you know, a good 30 seconds to see if anybody has questions. So these are sticky notes that represent the steps that the people were observed as taking. And the purple and orange are not separate steps. They're kind of qualities and parameters and additional information for that particular step. So this looks like it's a bit of a flow chart, but it really has these side things. They're not side flows or side steps. They're qualities of this. So uh, again, we're adding the, the purple was tools artifacts and knowledge. So the knowledge would be the reason they need the flowers. And then uh, the knowledge they don't have over here are they don't know what are the right flowers for the occasion. So that goes with the clerk suggesting the bouquets. Does anybody have any questions or confusions uh, before we move on to the next step, which is the second pass at this? I'm just going to give it a few seconds and see if anybody has a question. Kayleen has drawn it. a Brazilian C, so I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> but uh, any questions? Last 10 seconds. And people on LinkedIn, I apologize. You are always like way far behind on the stream. And uh, oh, it was an accident. Well, it's a good looking sedia or whatever that's called. All right. So if you have questions, please do type them. Otherwise, we'll have Larry continue with the second pass. You're good at this. Stop that. 
<laughs> All right. So um, the second pass, we take our big picture and we give it a little bit more detail. So um, again, you enter the shop and the clerk asks, why do you need the flowers? What did you do wrong? And then, of course, the uh, buyer gives the reason and uh, doesn't know what flowers are appropriate for saying, I'm sorry. And guys are starting to learn finally that roses are not the right solution for every problem. And you can interrupt me at any time if you have a, a question, that's fine. Mm -hmm. All right, so the clerk considers what bouquets apply to that reason. This is knowledge the clerk has. In this case, the clerk is not just a user, but they represent the system. So the clerk knows what bouquets fit the occasion and then suggests um, a set of bouquets. And then the buyer looks at the bouquets, looks at the, the size of the bouquet and the color because they know their wife likes purple. That's about all they know about flowers. My wife likes purple. Um, and then they finally select a bouquet, which in this case might be a large purple flowered bouquet. And if you've ever been to a florist shop, you'll know that there are no shopping carts there. This is important. It comes up in the design uh, strategy later on. And buyers only buy one bouquet at a time. So basically, you don't need a shopping cart in your e-florist, you know, your e-commerce store. Um, of course, then there's the upsell opportunity. The clerk always asks, well, do you need these in a vase or a box? Because a, a vase or vase, depending on how you say it, um, costs a little bit of money. Well, if, you know, the guy's saying, well, I don't want to just give her flowers that are going to die. Yeah, put them in a vase. I'll buy the vase. And so they ask, uh, they add the vase to the purchase. And then the clerk asks about delivery. Um, do you want these delivered or are you going to take them? Well, if they uh, want them delivered, then there's a whole nother set of st steps that we can add to it later. And of course, then they buy the flowers and then write a note. And the little note card goes in with the bouquet. So let us go back to the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, and I've got two questions for you as we sail back to PowerPoint land. Um, in fact, let me just put both of us up on the screen so that it's a little bit more human while I ask you these two questions. Um, one question we got from our friend Kayleen over in uh, Twitch, and she says, how do I know if I've collected enough secondary research to start my observations? I feel like I could do secondary research forever and never feel prepared for observations. <laughs> yeah, there's always a point where, um, well, you'll get to a point where you have enough to at least start, and that will help you identify what additional research you need to do. Because um, you'll have questions. See the orange stickies that I put on there? Those were things that we needed to go back out and watch again. So we ended up doing, I think we, we looked at about a dozen in order to succeed. And so um, I think we can go back and, oh, I wanna talk to the next slide, which is task role descriptions. Yeah, and I just want to mention with customer journey maps, it sounds kind of like um, <clears throat> uh, we run the risk that if we focus too much on a customer journey map, we end up making an incremental change to what we already have rather than doing something that, that could be a much bigger improvement or something more disruptive or innovative. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I like to say, and I'm known for saying this, that if you don't accurately define the problem, the best you can hope to do is solve the wrong problem very well. And we see that all the time. So if you're looking at a customer journey map, and this is why I say that, you know, it might be based on existing designs, which let's assume they're wrong. All you're going to do is put lipstick on that pig. You're going to incrementally improve a bad design or the wrong design is solving the wrong problem. So the whole point of task analysis and remaining technology agnostic or solution agnostic is to really get a much clearer idea of what is the right problem. And we're trying to look at the problem from the steps the users have to make, the cognitive steps that they have to make, the decisions they have to make, what knowledge do they have? So it's really redefining the problem. 
Super. And again, if anybody has any questions about this, put, put them up and I'll find the right moment to ask Larry. Don't hold your questions waiting for the right time. I will find it for you. So let me take you back to the slides. I think you wanted to see the next slide. And that yes. is task role descriptions. This Yes, and this is a big departure from the way a lot of people do task or you do you human-centered design. A lot of uh, work is being done. You do some observations and then you, you create personas. Well, it turns out that that's not exactly the best process to use because it, it has a lot of gaps in it. And I found that if you wait until your second pass to start using that information to create your, your user roles, then you end up getting more accurate information about the users. Now, when I talk about the users, I'm talking about their roles, not their personas. Personas, unfortunately, have been mischaracterized and misused. They tend to capture a whole person. Well, unfortunately, a person changes roles depending on what tasks they're performing. And so let me give you an example. You may have a persona of an expert Excel user, right? They can create the best looking charts and uh, they can do it quickly and they never make a mistake. So you think expert uh, Microsoft Excel user. However, if that person has to go and try to make a pivot table while they're an expert at charts, they're not an expert at pivot tables. So instead of saying one person is an expert, you say for this context, this role of chart maker is an expert. For this role of pivot table maker, they have to have a certain level of expertise. And the differentiating factor between those two is that knowledge base that we talked about. And I'm gonna describe that a little bit more in the next slide. Slides, please hold. <laughs> All right, so slide eight, role description. And audio? Yeah. Okay. I'm on it. <laughs> so leaving me. I just <laughs> I have faith. Uh, here's how I describe roles instead of personas. Instead of, you know, the emotions and all of that kind of stuff, what I try to capture are what's the trigger? See, a role is very contextual, so it has to be more specific. So um, the first way to specify a role is the trigger. What started this task? What is the task? What starts the task? In this case, the guy forgot his wife's birthday. Desired outcome. What does the user need in order to know that they've succeeded in, in accomplishing their task? The desired outcome in this case is I need to get, uh, you know, satisfy my wife. I need to say I'm sorry. The knowledge base. What do they already know about this? They know flowers work is a good way of saying I'm sorry and they're easy to get and I don't, you know, it's not hard to buy them. The missing knowledge. This is what differentiates a role from a persona. What does the user need to know but won't know in order to succeed? In this case, the buyer doesn't know what are the appropriate flowers to say, I'm sorry. And then, of course, I like to include not so much the emotion, but what's the state of mind of this user at this particular point? What stressors or emotions are impacting them? In this case, the user is trying to uh, make sure they buy the right uh, flowers. And the artifacts that we add to this description or what are the tools or the information or other things that the user applies to this task that we've identified in the task analysis. So now if we go back to the mural board, I'm I'll not show taking you, you there yet because we have a good question. The question okay. it from VJ in YouTube is, would you not include the aspect of how the role is to be assessed or measured, not the desired outcome, but the aspect of quality? Hmm, I usually don't get into that at this point. You can add that in later as your metric for success. That's a really good question. Um, but sometimes you can include that as part of the desired outcome. So the desired outcome might include an observable metric that you can use to identify how well the, the, uh, uh, the design has achieved the, the user's objective. That's a really good question. Great, thanks VJ. Um, all right, so I'm sending you back to the mural board. Uh, please hold, flipping, flipping. Okay, audio on, flipping, where am I going to? Are we up to, to go roll? The, the roll, right. 
So now we're looking at the role and I gotta move my screen so I can see it because I can't see it on there. Uh, ah. There it is. Okay, so like I said, the trigger, forgot the wife's birthday, what? desired outcome. She accepts his apology. Knowledge base, I know my wife likes purple flowers. Missing knowledge, what is the right flower to say I'm sorry? State of mind, I don't want to screw this up again. <laughs> yeah. So artifacts, there are different bouquets. Uh, I know the delivery address. Uh, I know that I want to include a gift note card. All right. So, so we, your desired we outcome is there. Yes. Okay, yeah. Cool. Apology accepted. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway. <laughs> But, it, you know, Vijay's question was more about the quality of it. And you can add that in later on uh, okay. after you've optimized the, the, the test or the, the task. All right. So let us um, go back to the well, actually I can talk to the slide. I don't need to. Uh, we don't need to switch back. Let's go ahead and scroll over to look at what the optimized task flow might look like. And in the optimized task flow, one of the things that I'm trying to do is take that second pass task flow and try to remove as many of the greens as possible and turn them into yellow. Basically, find ways to get the system to do more of the work for the user. Um, and one way to do that is to bridge the knowledge gap. Um, so actually, let's go back to the PowerPoints now, because I do want to talk about the next slide. OK, uh, slides up, audio on. All righty, let's go to bridging the gap, please. You got it. Oh, that was optimized next. tasks. Bridging the gap. <laughs> right. All right, so bridging the gap. This is where my designs have actually uh, made a big difference for the users because one of the things I like to do is incorporate knowledge into the design and bridge that gap between the difference of what the user knows and what they need to know. And the four best ways to do that are to include best practices into uh, the design or to add templates or to include intelligent defaults or to include examples. So let me give you an example of a best practices approach. Um, 20 years ago, when MP3 players were first coming out, there were a slew of MP3 players. Um, I dare anybody to name three of them off the top of their head without mentioning the iPod. Right? I owned a number of them, so I could. <laughs> OK. Well, what was interesting was, if you look at the, the his history of those and the numbers, they weren't selling that many of them. Why? Because the steps that they had to, that the user had to go through were very tech savvy steps. First, you had to go to mp3.com and find the music and download it into a directory structure that you had to create in your computer. And then you used a, um, a, a playlist manager like Music Match, which had, which had yet another interface that you had to figure out how to organize your, your uh, songs into uh, a playlist. And then you had to use the proprietary software for your device, like the Sony Zoom, and upload it into the Zoom. And then you finally got to play it. So there were four steps, and you basically had five separate interfaces you had to use. Well, sales of those didn't go so well. And then the iPod came out, and they had a really trick uh, UI on it. I really loved that jog dial. One of the interesting aspects of the jog dial was you could actually flip forward and backward in your playlist to play different songs, which you actually couldn't do in some of the MP3 players. They were just a streaming device, like a digital uh, cassette tape. So, but that didn't really make that much difference. It wasn't until the second year of the iPod where Apple married the iTunes with the Apple Store and the iPod and really changed it. And what did they do? They incorporated a best practice approach. Instead of relying on the users to know how to use all of these different technologies to create a playlist and play it, what they did was you went to the Apple Store. And when you clicked on a song that you liked, it automatically downloaded it into its own structure because the structure, a directory structure is really arbitrary. It doesn't matter to the computer how it looks. 
Anyway, it downloaded it into there. And then Apple was smart and created four generic playlists, album, artist, genre, and decade. So you had these four generic playlists to start with. So you had a starting point, an intelligent default, if you will. And then when you plugged your iPod in to uh, charge it, it automatically uploaded the songs and the playlist into your iPod. And then all you had to do is play it. So with best practices and uh, intelligent defaults, Apple was able to optimize the task flow from four steps to really one and a half steps. And that's when Apple took over the MP3 market and that alone changed the perception of, in the world of what Apple devices were. Apple makes things easy for people to use despite their lack of knowledge. They bridge the knowledge gap. Apple is a knowledge company, not a product company. I've got two All questions right, for you before we move on. One is Alrighty. from a friend of the show, Ikening, who says, Larry, I'm awestruck. I would really like to deep dive into this technique. What resource do you suggest, Larry? <laughs> well, there's a book coming out shortly. <laughs> <laughs> but no, there's another book that I like to, to point people towards. Um, it gives you some step-by-step uh, -step insights in how to do task analysis. And it's basically a book on uh, task analysis. I always forget the actual title, but the authors are Joanne Hackos and Ginny Reddish, and you can find it on Amazon. Um, I have it here somewhere. That's all right. You work it, so. on the next question. You answer the next question. I'll look it up on Amazon. So our next question is back to back to VJ, uh, who says, should we not look at the aspect of emotion or feeling of the role? If that emotion is not there, that role may not be the right fit. Or would you look at emotion as a separate thing? To be honest, I actually don't look at emotion anymore. I found it, it was um, if you can solve the user's problem, then that satisfies all of the emotional requirement requirements for that. So one of the things I like to say, this is a bit of a rant. You know, a lot of people say, oh yeah, UXer's job is to delight the user. Oh, that's all horse pucky. Because if the users are using a tool or a website or something because they have a need and or a problem to solve. And if you can solve that problem, you will delight the user. You cannot create delight. You can incite delight. But the only way to do that is to solve the user's problem in a way that's easy for them to do it and they know it's been solved. So don't worry so much about the emotions. You can address those later if you need to. But solving the user's problems in an easy format will make them happy and will delight the user. Yeah, I think if we ever did some research on customer support tickets, we would rarely see like, dear company, I'm feeling this and I wish I were feeling this. You know, won't you please help me feel more of this? But typically you're writing to a company, I can't get this thing done or I can't get this thing done efficiently. So I would agree that uh, while in some cases emotions might matter, I think if we focus on uh, task optimization, improvement, efficiency, we will bring people to the emotions that we, we hope to bring them to. And I've got the book for everybody. Uh, so let me uh, switch over to that screen. It looks like it's User and Task Analysis for Interface Design by Joanne Hakos and Janice Reddish. And the Kindle is only $76, but it looks like you can still get some paperbacks. All right, now where am I going? All right, let us... Um go back to the mural board and we'll show what an optimized task flow looks like. Okay. So remember everybody, we're taking the original steps from the second pass and we're trying to see what we can replace, uh, have the system do instead of the user to make the user's world better. All right. So the first five green stickies are pretty much the same steps that we saw in the uh, optimized task flow. And same with the purple and uh, uh, orange stickies. But what happens next? Let's scroll up a bit to the bottom. No, sorry. Oh, other up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a UX issue, isn't it? Okay, that's good right there. 
So after they select a bouquet, you know, the system can pop up and say, would you like um, that in a vase? So there is an emotional component here. One of the things I like to do is try to uh, imbue a sense of emotional investment into a design. Once the buyer uh, goes through and uh, sees a list of um, uh, bouquets. So here's something I wanna bring up. Usually about this point is when you start to recognize that you have defined a, a design strategy or the opportunity for a design strategy. And, you know, a lot of people talk about, talk about UX strategies being, you know, how you form the team and how you inter interact with each other, collaboration, all this, what artifacts do you build? I look at a UX strategy as what is the overarching defining uh, design paradigm that you're going to follow. And what we learned here in the um, uh, Pro Flowers example is people aren't there to buy the flowers. They're there for a reason. And that reason dictates what flowers they want. So we our strategy became pro flowers doesn't sell flowers they sell occasions so we organize the site around the occasions yeah ta -da. <laughs> so um, once the user selected an occasion they'd see the flowers they'd select the flowers the purple ones right so the very top well, i'm sorry go back, back up top. again i want to or something. Notice at the very top, we organize the bouquets by occasion. If you went to Pro Flowers, you would see that the first four tabs were occasion oriented. Only the fifth tab had you uh, organize things by the flowers that were in the bouquets. So it was organized by occasion. So you select the occasion, you select the bouquet. Now you can scroll again towards farther down the list. And since they had selected a bouquet, they felt good about that. It eased their um, state of mind. I know I'm not gonna screw up with this bouquet of flowers because this is in the apology section. So I know it's a good apology bouquet and it's purple like my wife likes. Then since they're already emotionally invested in that selection, then you can offer them, would you like a vase with that? And you can give them three choices of vase. This is an anchoring technique, a price anchoring. When you go to the restaurant, you want a bottle of wine with your dinner. They have, you know, one set of wines that are, you know, $50 a bottle, one set that's $20 a bottle, and one set that's $15 a bottle. And they do that on purpose because they know that you're not going to want to look like some cheap uh, skate and get the <laughs> cheaper one. $5 more, you can get a medium, good quality wine. And they also know you're not gonna spend $50. So this way they make that $20 bottle of wine look very affordable, even though it's $10 at the liquor store, but that's beside the point. But the point is you can do price anchoring here, offer three vases, which they did, and at three different price points. So anyway, somebody buys uh, or selects a vase and scroll down some more. Please. I'm working yeah. on it. So they add the vase to the purchase. And then was something very interesting. A lot of sites, e-commerce sites, whether it be flowers or books or whatever, had you, as soon as you selected something, they had presented you with the screen of, all right, give us your credit card. Well, that really interrupted that whole emotional investment aspect. And what we learned was if instead of asking for the credit card, we presented them with, oh, would you like to write a nice note to go with the flowers? And what we learned was that, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong, if a man writes anything that is somewhat poetic, roses are red, violets are blue, you know, it's a, a Pulitzer Prize winning um, uh, uh, poetry right there. So it created even more emotional investment in this. I'm sorry, dear, I really didn't mean that. And, I, you know, I won't stay out late with the boys again, yada, yada, yada. So you write the note and then when you write the note, you can write down who's it for and what delivery address do we want to uh, send these to? Well, so you're getting the information that you would need for the credit card screens, but in a backwards order. So you get the delivery address and you save that. <clears throat> and then you ask the user, is this the right, uh, is this the same as the billing address for the credit card? So you're using some intelligent defaults based on what you've learned. The other thing is, the system can capture 
you know, the reason for the, the, uh, the bouquet and what date it was. So for instance, if you're apologizing for some something, it's because you forgot something. Well, next year, two weeks ahead of time, Pro Flowers is gonna send a reminder. Oh, do you wanna forget your wife's birthday again? Or do you wanna, these are the flowers you got last year. You wanna send those again? You know, that kind of thing. Is that on here somewhere? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's right there. Save reason and date. That ah, creates okay. the reminder for next year. Right next to your cursor. Thank you. Alrighty then. So um, then you present delivery options. And now Pro Flowers did something really interesting with this. And they did not say, do you want two-day delivery? Do you want you know uh, three-day business delivery and all of that? They asked simply, again, this is knowledge design. They ask, what day do you want those uh, flowers to show up there? And if you said, I wanted them there, I want them there on Friday, um, then they would say, well, these are the two delivery options you have to get them there by Friday. So they took a lot of the guesswork out because, you know, when you send stuff and it says three uh, business days, but we know FedEx uh, delivers on Saturday. Does that include Saturday too? I'm not sure when these are gonna get there. And that kind of confusion actually causes people to stop and think. It becomes a friction point in the task flow, whether you're Amazon or, or Land's End or, or you know, Pro Flowers. So yeah. So instead of asking, you know, what delivery method they want, ask them when they want it to get there and show them delivery methods that will get them there on that day or by that day. And then again, like I said, you've captured the address for the recipient. So you can ask, is this, is the, the delivery address the same as the billing address? And then you can ask for the credit card number. So all along the way, we've built up this emotional investment in this. So what we found in usability testing, remember I put that as part of the process, was that when we had that flow, by the time, and we actually let people, gave them real flowers as part of our usability test. By the time they got to the credit card screen, it wasn't like, oh my God, a credit card, I have to pay for this. It was like, quick, how do I fill this out so I can get these flowers sent? I'm excited about this. So it really changed the emotion, if you will, by leveraging the emotional engagement aspect in through the design. <clears throat> so um, maybe that'll help answer your question, VJ. I still like the question, but I, I wanted to see if I could turn it around a little bit. So, I've got a question. Yes. Here it comes. A uh, friend of the show and Slack buddy Chang is asking, provided all teammates observed a few users finish the task and all teammates had a certain level of understanding of user behavior, could task analysis be a team workshop? That's a giant no for me, but Larry, would you make task analysis a team workshop and get together a cross-functional team to sticky note this? There's two answers to that question. I, I don't think his question was so much cross-functional. I think a cross-functional team adds some complexity to a task analysis. Um, the best task analysis is done if you have everybody do some observations. That way you can get you know, the same perspective and everybody contributing. But if you have a cross-functional team, you need to perform this a little bit differently. You have to guide some of this so that you can extract some of that cross-functional knowledge out of it. So for instance, there may be somebody on the team who didn't do the observations, but is familiar with how they build the bouquets, what bouquets they build, and they can lend insight into that. But I wouldn't necessarily rely on them at the same level I would rely on somebody's observations that actually went and watched people buy flowers. So you can include cross-functional members. You just have to know what they can or cannot contribute. Okay, so if I'm understanding you correctly, this could be a team thing if a bunch of us were researchers and we all did the observations, but if it's more of a cross-functional team where we've got uh, engineers, product, project, maybe somebody from marketing or another subject matter expert, if we tried to do that in a workshop, we just have to make sure people are staying more in their lanes? Uh, to some degree, yeah. So for instance, we at the uh, Air Force Cyberworks studio, we um, conduct a lot of design sprints, we call them, but they're not really a design sprint. They're a problem definition sprint. And we do task analysis with cross-functional members. 
but they're all familiar with the task domain to some degree already, whether they're uh, actual actors in that domain or they've observed other people acting and didn't know they were making those observations. But we still get them into cross-functional teams, break them apart after we've done a group session of describing um, what the, the first or the big picture or the second pass level of the task flow is <clears throat> and have them break that down even further based on their own input. So it's a guided discovery, which leads me to another uh, thing that I like to promote. And that is um, with previous clients, what I've done is create a wall of shame where we put different uh, human centered design artifacts up on a wall and let people contribute to those. So for instance, I would have a, a user role description up there. I would have some task analysis artifacts up there and let people add to it because you do get good input from people, but it has to almost be structured to some degree from them if they haven't been part of the observation. But allowing them to add it to the task flow is a good way to get some of that unstructured information into a structured environment. And we do have another question from Vijay, but before I put that up, I just want to mention quickly that I think a lot of you know that I'm not a fan of workshops. I think we hold too many of them in, in CX and UX. And just remember, make sure if you are holding some sort of team meeting, exercise, or workshop, that you are being respectful of other people's time. Do you really need to take them away from their mission-critical work to help you with yours? Make sure that it is something that is really going to add to what you're doing rather than make us look like we are incompetent and we can't seem to get stuff done without calling a large group meeting. It's very different than what Larry said, which is you put you create something within UX and you put it up and see if people want to add to it as they have time to, to take a look at it. So again, just make sure that, that a workshop is the best way to go and the best use of everybody's time because I think if we thought more critically about some of these things, we would hold a lot fewer workshops. That's one woman's opinion. Um, VJ, you will be unsurprised to hear he has a question about emotions. So uh, VJ asks, um, if we include the outcome as a specific emotion to get to, would it not help revisit the role definition better? Again, I'm going to reiterate what I said for, uh, before, and that is that we can design a world that elicits outcome or elicits emotions or delight or whatever, but that is not our, our primary motive. Um, again, solving the user's problems. And the only way to do that is understand the tasks, the cognitive and mentally uh, demanding aspects of it, the knowledge basic aspects of it. That you create an emotion out of that at the end is coincidence in many respects. But if you solve the user's problems, you will achieve the right emotion. Now you can start by including that emotion in there, but em emotion design, and I think if you uh, listen up to what Don Norman said about designing for emotion, it, it sounds a lot like what I'm saying, or I'm sounding a lot like what he said. And that is that you can't really design for the emotion. You can design a world that elicits certain uh, behaviors and thus uh, reactionary emotions, but you can't design for an emotion. Yeah, and again, the, that goes back to success criteria and how we're going to measure things. If we think our desired emotion is celebratory and we find that people are pleased that they accomplished their task, is that a success or a failure? So um, we have another question and then I'll let you get back to your world. Um, over on Twitch, Undefined0156 asks, what is hierarchical task analysis? Are there different types of task analysis? You know, um, I've heard hierarchical. I haven't seen an example of it, so I can't really speak to what that is. Uh, I have seen uh, people that I think are uh, fairly good at this <clears throat> use a mind mapping tool to create some type of hierarchy of the task. Um, and I think the way that I'm looking at it is more of what is the cognitive task flow for the user as opposed to what I've seen of hierarchy is, you know, uh, dependency related uh, tasks, you know, what tasks, tasks and dependent on. Yes, exactly. So uh, I look at it more from the user's cognitive and knowledge base, not so much what are the functional um, uh, relationships between different steps. So okay. I don't know if that answered your question. Well, they can ask a follow up question. We have some we have some more minutes. I hope we'll make it. Do you want to go back to slides? 
Yeah, one last slide. All right. And last slide, drum roll. Ta -da. So <laughs> the whole idea of, of do, using these different colors is once you've got the optimized task flow, you've got some remaining green stickies. Those are the uh, what you, uh, you need to design screens for. <clears throat> and you've got a task flow. You need to stick to the task flow and you design screens for the green stickies. And one of the things that you need to do is avoid adding things because of what if, what if the user wanted to do this? Stick to the task. You can always add those on as a, you know, a subordinate task later. <clears throat> but if you start adding for what ifs, what if the user wanted to do, what if, well, what if a frog had wings? It wouldn't bump its butt every time it took a hop. So you can over-design something by answering these what if questions. Stick to the tasks, you've optimized it for a reason. And I like to say that you need to focus on one task per screen. Now, a task may take multiple screens, but each of those screens is gonna be dedicated to one task. You don't have, well, what if the user wanted to go over here? What if the user wanted to go over there? Stick to the task, one task per screen. And that's basically all I have to offer. I have a quick question back on the mural board. I'm going to switch over there for a second. Um, sure. This should be the mural board now on the screen. So when when I look at this um, optimized task flow, and obviously a lot of the greens have been replaced with yellows because there's things the system can take over for the... Um, uh, the user, I still saw enter shop and I was a little confused. Are we, in this case, since it's a system, are we talking about entering a virtual shop or, or how would you explain that? Yeah. yeah, there would be some entry aspect of it. So when they get there, you know, how is it, you know, you could expand this out even further. How is it that they know to go there? Um, so for instance, Pro, Pro Flowers was very active in sending out all kinds of um, emails and TV advertising and radio advertising. And each of those had, you know, go in in the next 30 minutes and get a free vase, use this, uh, this keyword. And so uh, they had different ways of getting people to enter the shop. Got it. Okay, thanks. And then also when we talk about designing for the green stickies, which are the, the user steps, we still have these purples and oranges. So how do those play into our our design process? What can we do there? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up because I neglected to mention that. Those are the artifacts that go on that screen for that step. Okay. And that's so, how you can think about it. So now you know what things go on the screen. Now, keep in mind, this is an overly simplified example so that we could get it all on. The actual task flow on this was much longer, okay. but I you know, uh, boiled it down so we could at least present it and talk about it in you know, the one hour show we have. Okay, so hypothetically, if we're giving someone a screen where the, the task at hand is compare bouquets, we might have sorts and filters that address price, size, colors, occasion, and, and of course, trusting the system to, to suggest the right flowers for the occasion. And these might be potential designs or solutions that, that would resolve these. Right, exactly. Okay, super. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to clarify that. And again, we have just five or so more minutes with Larry. So if you have uh, last questions, get them in. We've got one from Solomon over on LinkedIn. And he asks, how to avoid designing for what ifs? What if it was a low bandwidth Friday afternoon and the user accidentally turned off their computer? <laughs> no. Didn't you just ask me about what ifs with a what if question? Yeah. So I, I guess I guess the question is, a lot of us feel like we should design for some of these what ifs and possible outcomes. How do we know when we've gone too far? Um, well, if you're sitting in the in the room and somebody says, well, what if you've gone too far? As soon as somebody <laughs> asks that question, you've gone too far. Okay. So really stick to the task. You can always add stuff in later. And I'm going to uh, uh, paraphrase a fam famous quote by uh, a famous designer by the name of uh, uh, Antoine saint Exupéry. Um, oh, who wrote The Little Prince? Yes, 
Perfection in design is achieved not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to remove. So make your design as simple as possible. You can always add stuff later, but if you start adding stuff now, you get stuck into this rabbit hole and you start chasing all of these what ifs and you end up with a very complicated interface. Now, the other thing I wanna mention, when you design, design for tasks, like I said, one task per screen. What that means then is, and in the case of Pro Flowers, you may have to duplicate or replicate a function or a feature in that task flow if it exists, even if it exists in another task flow. And that's perfectly fine. I don't know why some people said, well, we've already got this feature, it's over here. We don't need to replicate it. No, you can. So for instance, if you go to Pro Flowers and actually look at all of the occasions, you'll notice they only have about 30 bouquets altogether. But you'll see six over here, seven over here that are different, five over here, and maybe even you know some of the duplicates from other ones. But you don't really care you know, that there are duplicates if you're the buyer. You just care that you're buying a bouquet that's right for that occasion. Got it. Um, thank you. Um, are there any other questions before uh, we wrap up? And again, while we're waiting for last questions, just a few reminders of some of the live events that are coming next week. So you can mark your calendars. Um, Monday, the 15th of February, we'll be doing uh, UX and Autism with Sean McSharry. Also, please follow us on Twitch, DeltaCX.com. Uh, we're also doing a February uh, giveaway. Put type exclamation point giveaway in Twitch, and you'll see how to enter to get a uh, full color hardcover book signed by me and shipped from me. Uh, next Tuesday, of course, Office Hours Ask Me Anything. And next Wednesday, join me with Darren Hood as we talk about what would it look like if UX were actually held accountable at our jobs and the good stuff we think <laughs> will come of that. Of course, Monday the 22nd will be podcast episode 100. I plan to order a cake. Um, and that's going to be with Dimitris Niavis, who's going to talk about data informed versus data driven. Um, uh, Tuesday, the 23rd office hours, ask me anything. And Wednesday, the 24th, the comedy podcast, where I'm going to read you some of the slides from my upcoming, uh, training program for HR. And these slides will be the worst UX job descriptions I have seen in the last six months. Yeah. And uh, Cesar is in LinkedIn and says, chasing edge case scenarios can get expensive with little value. I love the simple analogy. Thank you, Larry. Um, so just in case we are uh, towards the end here, because I'm not sure I'm seeing any other questions from anybody. So I guess we got it right this time. We weren't overrun with weird questions like, can you do a task analysis after a survey? And you know, hopefully people got it now. Please, last chance, people, ask your questions. But while you do that, Larry, where can people find you and follow you and, and worship you? <laughs> worship, I don't know about, but I'm on LinkedIn. Look, look me up, uh, Larry Marine on LinkedIn. That's it. You're not a tweeter. That's it. No, I, I, I have a Twitter handle, but I hardly ever tweet. Okay, then don't don't chase them there. Uh, that last chance, people. Any last questions? Otherwise, we're going to wrap up with my thanks for everybody joining us for the micro lesson. And of course, thank you, Larry, for technically doing this twice. This was the take two do over version. I think it went much better uh, this time. So hopefully it's a winner. Uh, if you missed it or if you want to share this with someone, this will be on YouTube archived in a playlist called micro lessons. So that's going to be archived there nearly immediately. You'll be able to find it there and share it out with friends, family, loved ones, managers, coworkers, etc. cetera. Um, final question from Fizayo over in LinkedIn says, who, um, I, I'm gonna go with when, when can we not use task analysis? Is there, I mean, to me, it's, it's, it should be used all the time and maybe even in place of customer journey maps. When should we not use task analysis? And that is the correct answer, Debbie. You should always be able to use it. If, you, if you're using something else, you're probably not defining the problem so much as creating a, a solution without knowing what the problem is. You can always use some form of task analysis. We use it daily um, at CyberWorks and it works out really well for us. Yeah, we've been able to to Go ahead. We've been able to identify problems that nobody knew was a problem just by doing some task analysis. Beautiful. That's the way.
That's the way. Um, so I'm going to play us out of here. Larry, thank you again so, so, so much. And everybody, that's it broadcasting for this week. I've been talking your heads off. But again, follow, especially on Twitch. I'm trying to get 50 followers this month. So join us on Twitch where the delay is really short. And you'll get your questions in faster. So everybody have a great and safe weekend. And I'll see you next week. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Debbie. Delta CX, available for CX and UX consulting, projects, and training. Contact us for a free consultation.